All right. Well, we'll be there in a minute. Doing the synoptics in here, getting right down to the point of Jesus' death. We're actually, this would be Tuesday, would be Tuesday, the week of the, of the, um, of his crucifixion. So this is when he comes up. We started this last time, comes up out of the temple. He'd been in the temple teaching that day, that Tuesday. And now he's coming back out, probably going back towards Bethany, probably where he was staying. And when he gets up on top of the, above the temple, uh, up on the mount, uh, they pointed out the buildings and basically was showing him the beauty of the buildings. And Jesus said to them, you see these great buildings, not one stone will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. So he makes a really big statement to them. And the temple's been there a long time, long time. Built, original temple was built by Solomon. Of course, Israel was there before that under David. The temple was torn down by the Babylonians, and then and then uh, they built the second temple in um, in the 580s. Well, been about uh, early, well, about 510, 5 something BC, and around 500 BC, they built the second temple. So that second temple had been there for 500 years. Uh, Herod he remodeled it. Started that before Jesus was born. Started the remodel on the temple before Jesus was ever born. That remodel had been going on and would go on for about 60 years. So it was a really big project and was still in ongoing when Jesus was on the earth. It still actually was working on the temple. But predominantly it was done. The buildings were done, so it was pretty magnificent. The seed of Judaism. And they were, of course, very proud of that, as we would be. And when Jesus said that, they, uh, it made them wonder, when will this happen? Now, I think... You have to understand their mindset here, not just look at it through our eyes. You have to think what they thought. What would they think? You know, Jesus hadn't died yet, right? Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. He was still there. He had told them multiple times he was going to be handed over, that he was going to be killed, even though they still didn't quite get that, right? Still didn't quite get that whole idea. They were still kind of looking for an earthly king, somebody to reign, I think. I believe they were. I think that's my opinion. And I think that Jesus, uh, when they thought about Jerusalem, they thought about Old Testament prophecy, they thought about bringing Israel back together, as you and I would have thought, they naturally thought that would happen from Jerusalem. That would happen from the temple, right? That's Judaism. That's where you would gather them back would be Jerusalem. So when Jesus said this building is going to be torn down to them, that meant the end, right? When all this is gone, there's nothing. That's it. That's the end. That's the end of everything, right? When these buildings are gone, it's, it's over. It's the end. So I think when they asked Jesus' this question to them, it would have meant, you know, when's the end? When's the end of time? When's the end? That, that would be the end. And so they ask him a question. And I think it's interesting if you look at, um, at especially at Matthew. I think Matthew is really is the end. Inter- Matthew's kind of our Jew. And when they did the message, they went to him privately. And basically they said three things. They said, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So there's three questions right here in Matthew. Now in Luke and John, it just says, when will these things be fulfilled? Or when will these things, when these things, what will be the sign when these things, what, when's it going to happen? What will be the sign when these things will take place? So, is it one question? Is it three questions? Are they thinking about three different things happening? Or are they thinking about one thing happening? Right? I think that's a question you really, we really have to ask ourselves when we start this discourse here. Were they asking him three separate things? Now, to you and I, these are separate events. Right? The destruction of Jerusalem, that's going to happen in 71 AD. You and I know that now. 
They didn't know that, right? We, we know that. Destruction of Jerusalem is going to happen in 71 A.D. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. There won't be one stone left upon another. Lo and behold, what Jesus says is going to take place, right? Now, the, what you have to ask yourself here is, is that the question? Okay, is that the question? Did they assume that it was one event? In other words, even though we're saying, when will these things happen? What will be the sign and the end of the age? Is that written in hindsight? Matthew, these are all written in hindsight. When Matthew wrote this, was this the literal question that was asked? It's always a good question to think about, right? How did Jesus answer? Did Jesus answer the question as in one event or as in multiple events? That's something we have to look at when we get into this discourse. This is a really big passage for millennialists about the end of time, okay? Um, rapture, the end, of, the end of things. So it's a really important passage in the Bible. How do we interpret it? How do we look at it? What does it say? What was Jesus trying to say? What was their question? So let's go with Matthew. And let's say, okay, there's three things, Matthew. In Matthew, there's three questions. So let's take the three questions. Number one, when will these things happen? Okay. What things? Right? The destruction of the temple. The coming of Christ again. The end of the age. Multiple, plural. When will these things happen? Okay. The other question is, what will be the sign of your coming? Now, that's kind of an interesting question because Jesus hasn't left yet, right? So what's going to be the sign that you're coming back, right? And then the third question, when will be the end of the age? What age? The end of time? The end of Judaism? The end of the time until Jesus comes back to restore? See, there's a lot of different ways you can look at these questions, you see. So let's see how Jesus answers the question the first thing jesus says to them is he says number one you're not gonna know when i'm coming this is rex's paraphrase okay he says because a lot of things are gonna happen all right he says you're gonna get misled right many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is near, and we know that will happen, and mislead any, but don't pay attention to them. Matthew says, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs but be on your guard they will deliver you to the courts you'll be flawed to the synagogues you will stand before governors and kings and testimony to them the gospel must be preached to all nations when they arrest you and hand you over do not worry beforehand about what you are to say but whatever is given you in that hour if it is not you speak but it is the holy spirit Their idea of the whole world is not idea, our idea of the whole world, okay? Number one, when you read this. A lot of people take this passage and they're like, well, the, nothing will happen until the whole world hears. You and I view of the world is way, way, way different than, than their view of the world. <laughs> way, way, way different, <laughs> okay? Um, so you can't, Paul said the gospel was preached to the whole world. That's what Paul says, okay? In the time of Paul. Paul said the gospel was preached to the whole world in Paul's time. So when people read this and they're like, oh, he's talking about the whole world. That's not what we're talking about, all right? So when you read these things, you really got to put yourself back in their mindset, not in your mindset, not in what you think. Because I promise you, these people still thought the earth was flat, Okay? They still thought the earth was flat. We didn't think the earth was round for centuries, centuries after this, before we come to the conclusion the earth was actually round. So the world to them is not the world to you. Their view of it was 100% different. 
So when Jesus said it's going to be preached to the whole world, Paul says it was preached to the whole world, okay? So you got to kind of keep that in mind as we go through this. It says, when they arrest you, do not worry, and that's basically to them. I'm going to tell you what to say. You'll be betrayed, brother against brother. Children rise up against parents. They will deliver you to tribulation. They will kill you. You'll be hated because of me. They will put some of you to death. You'll be hated. Yet not a hair of your head will perish, he says, which doesn't, of course, apply to all of them. And I think that's a little bit different, a different idea here than what we maybe would like to think. He says, at that time, many will fall away, betray one another, hate one another. Uh, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. By the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. The one who endures, he will be saved. All three Gospels say the same thing. He's not talking about their physical salvation. He's talking about their eternal salvation, right? Those who endure to the end will be saved. All these things are going to happen to you. doesn't mean the end's coming. doesn't mean I'm coming back. doesn't mean that, that uh, I'm coming back to do what you think. Just because people are hurting you, just because there's wars, just because nations fight nations and kingdoms fight kingdoms, and there's earthquakes and there's famines, it doesn't mean that I'm coming again. The world doesn't believe that, do they? How many times you talk to people and they say these things all the time, right? Uh, it's got to be close to the end. Jesus is pretty plain. Doesn't mean anything, right? These things are going to happen. Life's going to go on. That's what Jesus is telling them. Life's going to go on. People are going to hate you. People are going to kill you. People are going to rise up against you. Nations are going to fight. Wars are going to happen. Natural disasters are going to occur. The, life is going to go on. Okay, that's what Jesus is saying. Life's going to go on. It's going to keep going. And bad things are going to happen just like they always have. That's not going to change. Life's going to go on. But it will be preached to the whole world, as Paul says that it is. Paul says in Romans 1.8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Paul understood that, yes, it was the world, the known world. And that's what we're talking about here. So that's going to happen. Paul says in Romans, that's already occurred. That's occurred. So, so that thing has already happened. But then it gets more complicated. There's three questions. What was the first thing Jesus said? He said, these will all be torn down. Right? Isn't that the first thing? Je that's what Jesus said. Jesus wasn't talking about coming again, wasn't talking about the end of the age, wasn't talking about any of that. Jesus' statement was real plain. Not one of these stones will be left upon another. Okay? That's the question. Not when am I coming again, or that's the statement. Not when I'm going to come again, or when the kingdom's going to come, or none of that. It was, that was his statement. Now, Jesus is going to give them warning, okay? And his warning is real simple. And it has to do with prophecy that this gets so, can get so complicated. It's not complicated, but the world makes this very complicated. And I don't know how complicated I need to make it for you this morning. Um, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, right through daniel the prophet this is daniel's prophecy okay the abomination that causes desolation what is it that's the question okay what is it well there's a lot of thoughts about for me it's not difficult at all because I think it's real plain. It stands in the holy place, according to Daniel. It's the abomination that causes desolation. And to me, it's the Roman standard. I mean, that plain and simply, that's what it is to me. The Roman standard was the eagle. Okay? That was the Roman standard. The Romans, the Romans who's going to destroy Jerusalem? Right? Titus going to put siege on Jerusalem. Rome's going to destroy Jerusalem. Now what Jesus is trying to say is, he's saying, listen, when the abomination that causes desolation. Now about, oh, 100 and something years before Jesus, 200 years before Jesus, 
Um, Jerusalem was conquered and by the Epiphany, Epiphanies that he put a it, they actually slaughtered pigs in the in the temple, which of course pigs are unclean to Judaism, right? They actually slaughtered pigs in the temple, and a lot of people said, "Well, that's the according to Daniel, that's abomination that causes desolation." Okay, because that would have been an abomination to the Jews, right? But any graven image is an abomination to Judaism, right? But the the Ten Commandments are plain about that: you shall not have any graven images, right? Graven images. Graven images are an abomination. The standard of Rome was the eagle. They carried that on a staff. And that, and that was the abomination. He says, uh, stand in the holy place. And he says, let the reader understand. So in other words, they probably understood that maybe even better than we did. And he says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Well, when's that going to happen? It's going to happen in 70 A.D. That's when they're going to start sieging Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be sieged for 14 months. They're going to siege Jerusalem. The armies are going to surround Jerusalem. Now, that's happened before in history. And the Jews weren't real smart about the whole thing, okay? And they thought, well, we're going to be all right. Help's going to come. God's going to deliver us. We're, we're the God's chosen nation. He's going to deliver us. We got you know, we got faith. God's going to do that. We're not going to flee. We're not going to give in to the people around us because God's going to save us. And then guess what? The Babylonians come in, wipe out Jerusalem, burn it to the ground, destroy the temple. Didn't work out, right? Poor old Jeremiah the whole time was saying, listen, you idiots, right? <laughs> you need to do something because this isn't going to end well for you. That's a really big paraphrase, but that's what Jeremiah was saying, right? And But now Jesus is saying, listen, when this happens, there's not going to be a deliverance in this. In other words, when you see this happening, you need to leave. Because this isn't going to be me coming back to save Jerusalem. I'm not going to come back and save it. I'm not going to, God's not going to step in and intercede. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, which in my mind is a Roman standard, and when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, which is the Roman army, he says you need to leave. Because God's not going to spare it. And this is going to get destroyed, just like I said it's going to get destroyed. Now, if this was the end of time, what difference would it make where you go? Why, where are you going to run? You understand what I'm saying? If this is the end of time, why would you flee to the mountains? Is that going to matter? Why would you worry if you are pregnant? Why would you, any of that matter? It wouldn't matter at all. He's telling Christians, because this is going to be to Christians, when you see it coming, go get out of town. Now, we know historically that they listened to this. Because historically, there were very few Christians killed in the destruction of Jerusalem. Because why? They left. The Jews stayed. The Jews thought, oh, God's going to deliver us. Help's going to come. You know, this is... How do you see Jesus as a Savior? Do you see him as a Savior of Judaism, or do you see him as a Savior of the world? If you see him as a Savior of Judaism, then how could he let the temple be destroyed? Why would he let Jerusalem be destroyed? Why wouldn't he come back and save it, you see? But they didn't see it that way. Jesus says, you better get out. And he tells them, he says, those who in Judea must flee to the mountains, and in the midst of the city must leave, and in the country must not enter the city. Because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. The one who is on the housetop must not go down to get in to get anything out of his house. Right? Don't go back in. You need to leave now. The one who is a field must not go back to get your coat. Woe to your pregnant and her, nurse, and her nursing. I pray it may not happen in the winter. Because why? Because it's harder to run when it's cold. Right? It's harder to flee when it's cold. Why would you be pregnant? Because it's hard to run when you're pregnant, right? I pray that you're not nursing because it's hard to flee with children. And Jesus is telling them plain and simple, when you see the abomination that caused desolation, when you see the army surround Jerusalem, you need to get out. There will be tribulation such as not occurs at the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved but for the sake of the elect, he shortened the days. There will be great distress. The destruction of Jerusalem was awful. It was awful. Historically, Josephus Flavius, our great historian we talk about all the time, 
And the reason his name is Josephus Flavius is because he, he sided with the Romans. That's where the Flavius comes from. That's why he survived to write about it. He's like the guy with a grenade when all the soldiers jumped on the grenade and the one guy was standing in the corner and the sergeant's like, why didn't you jump on the grenade? He goes, somebody's got to be here to tell everybody what happened. <laughs> all right? Josephus was that guy. <laughs> he was the one standing in the corner that said, somebody's got to survive to tell everybody what happened, right? And they crucified so many people, they ran out of crosses. Do you know that? They nailed them to the, they nailed them to the, to the, to the walls. Because literally they ran out of wood to crucify people. They destroyed the temple. They tore it down. There wasn't one stone left upon another. They burned the temple. Titus told them not to do that. He says, don't destroy the temple. But they did. They burned it. And when they burned it, the metal, the gold, ran down between the, 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 the uh, stones of the temple because there's no mortar in the temple stones. They're just set one on top of another. And the precious metal ran underneath underneath the crevices of those stones and the Roman soldiers took bars and they pried the stones off of one another to get to the metal that had run between them and what Jesus said came to pass there wasn't one stone left upon another and Jesus said you're going to get out because you're going to die if you don't and it's pretty plain to me what we're talking about here now you want me to throw a kink in it for you <laughs> You're good, huh? No kinks. Okay. <laughs> so if you're premillennialist, if you believe that Jesus is coming back for the thousand year reign and all that, if you're a premillennialist, the only way Daniel's prophecy can be fulfilled is if there's a temple. Okay? There's no other way. So if you're premillennialist, and you really believe Jesus is coming again and we're going to have a thousand year reign on earth and that's going to happen, there's something that has to happen. Prophetically, there's something that has to happen in order for that to take place. You've got to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. You've got to do it. So if this abomination that causes desolation, according to Daniel, is about what premillennialists think it is, then you've got to build the temple again, you've got to start the sacrifice again, and there has to be abomination that causes desolation in the holy place. All that has to happen again. You see, pretty complicated. Premillennialism is a very complicated doctrine. We don't think it is, but it is. Because that would have to take place again. Jesus is saying the abomination that causes desolation. I'm not going to get into the prophecy of Daniel this morning. But the abomination that causes desolation has to stand in the holy place, Okay. And the only place that's a holy place is in the temple. So in order for that to happen again, the temple would have to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. If you listen to bot radio and places like that, they're always talking about supporting Israel, funding Israel, uh, rebuilding the temple. I listened to one the other day, and the guy says, we're already making the articles for the temple, the lampstands, the tables, and we're storing them in a warehouse. When the temple gets rebuilt, we can get all that back in there and start the sacrifice again so that this prophecy can be fulfilled. Do you understand how ludicrous all that is? Am I, is anybody understanding how important this little piece of Scripture is? It's ludicrous to think that, right? Um, because that happened here. Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and when we understand that, the rest of that kind of flies out the window. It's really an important piece of Scripture. He says, if anyone says, behold, here he is, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and great wonders, won't they? Sure. It says, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all the nations. In Jerusalem, be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. True? True? And it's being trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. Am I right? Today. Am I right? Until the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Who all claims Jerusalem? Right? Who all claims Jerusalem? The Jews? Right? The Muslims? Why do the Muslims, why, do the, why, is, why is that Temple Mount so important to the Muslims?
what happened? What, what happened on the Temple Mount? Abraham. Abraham offered Isaac, right? On the Temple Mount, according to legend, according to tradition. Abraham is a father of Islam just as much as he's a father of, of Judaism, right? Abraham's the father of three of all three religions, the great the three biggest religions in the world all have Abraham as their father. Right? Judaism, Islam, Christianity. All have Abraham as their father. How important is the Temple Mount to Islam? Well, it's it's holy to them just as much as it's holy to the Jews. Right? Is it holy to Christians? Well, it really shouldn't be, but right? But we think it is. Some some Christians think it is. So that land is in turmoil that land is being trampled underfoot uh, by the gentiles and will be until the times of the gentiles are fulfilled what's the times of the gentiles are fulfilled what do you think that when, when will the time of the gentiles be fulfilled do you think are we in the last age we're in the last age so when are the time of the gentiles will be fulfilled when will that be When Jesus comes again, we're in the last age, right? There's not another age. There's not another time. Time of the Gentiles is, is us. We're the Gentiles. This is our time, right? When the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled, it will be the end. It says, but take, but take heed. I've told you everything in advance. So if they say to you he's in the wilderness, do not go out? Or if he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as lightning comes from the east to flash to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Just as the lightning flash comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what does that mean? Can you expect it? Do you expect it? Would you know it? Oh, you ain't going to know it. Just as lightning flashes that quick, right? What, is, what does Paul say in a moment, right, in Corinthians? In the moment, in a twinkling of the eye, Paul says, right? So he says, this is going to happen fast. Okay, but immediately, there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars on the earth dismay. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to get into this. Men fanning from the fear, the expectation of things are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. But in those days after that tribulation, after what tribulation? After that tribulation, destruction of Jerusalem, right? Isn't that what we were just talking about? So he says after that tribulation, uh, but in what days? In those days. You got really got to pay attention to what's going on here. <laughs> in those days. So we're, if we, the tribulation, we talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, and he says in those days, things are going to happen, Right? In those days, these, boy, that's big, isn't it? Sun will be dark and the moon not give us light. Stars will fly from the sky. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Well, surely we'll see that. I mean, that's, that's really big. How can we miss it, right? Well, we're talking about apocalyptic language here. What does it say? What does it mean? So in order to understand what this means, I've got to take you and show you what it really means in other places. Because I got to give you a standard here. I got to give you a, I have to give you a parallel. And I can do that. I can do that. And I'm going to do that. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Oh, sure, we'll see that. The tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky. I want you to look at font here with me for a minute. Um, I'm going to back up. Most of y'all know this. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again for those in here that don't know this. Let me find my clicker pointer thingy. Whenever you see font change in, the, in your Bible, right here, font change, you see the font change? All capital. Sun will be dark and moon will not give the last stars fall. Right here, you see that? Font change right here. Font change. See it? Font change. Son of man coming in the clouds. Go to the next screen. Font change. See the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky. Great trumpet. They will gather together. Um, see the Son of Man coming right here. See those font changes um, in your Bible? 
So whenever you see those font changes in your Bible, it means that it's an Old Testament scripture that's been put into, that's, that's been quoted by Jesus in the New Testament. So anytime you see that font change, it means that's been said before in the Old Testament. We're bringing it, we're, it's a quote. It's an Old Testament quote, okay? When that's, they, they show you that by changing the font in your Bible. So when you see a font change, that's what that means. And you need to keep that in mind as I dive into this next little part of this. So, so what does it mean? This is in the Bible all over. Not just in the New Testament, not just in the book of Revelation. It's in Isaiah, it's in Ezekiel, it's in other places in the Bible. These things that we talk about, blood moons. Y'all have heard of blood moons, right? Everybody in here sure people talk about blood moons, right? Uh, we talk about blood moons. We talk about stars falling from the sky. We talk about coming on clouds. We talk about constellations not giving light. These are reoccurring themes in Scripture. So what do they mean? I mean, it seems like, well, if I take that literally, it seems pretty straight up, right? Um, this is what happens. But it's not, okay? So let's look at some parallels so we can understand this a little better. Because you think, how could I miss this? Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation. He will exterminate its sinners from it, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarier, scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken from its place, and the fury of the Lord of hosts on the day of his burning anger, and it will be that like a haunted gazelle or like sheep with none to gather them. They will each turn to his own people and each will flee to his own land. Anyone who is found will be thrust through and anyone who is captured will fall by the sword. Their little ones also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their house will be plundered and their wives ravished. Wow. Right? Woof. That's big stuff. Right? Constellations aren't going to shine. Things are going to happen. That surely, surely, Rex, God's talking about the end of the world. No. Nah. This is Isaiah. And this is talking about the destruction of Babylon by the Medes. You see, did any of that really happen? Did the constellation stop shining? Did all that really happen? Really? Literally? No. None of that happened right? What does it mean? In the Bible, whenever we talk about celestial things, stars, constellations, moons, really we're talking about nations. That's the way that God says it. When he says, I'm coming on a cloud, it means it's going to happen quick. It's certain, okay? How do we know? Because we see it in the Old Testament. These exact same, and you remember I showed you in that, in that font text where Jesus was quoting Old Testament Scripture in the New Testament? He's quoting Isaiah. He's quoting Ezekiel. He's quoting things that have already happened. They understand what that means. You and I try to put great significance on it, try to make it into our own thing, and try to scare ourselves to death with it. Why do we do that, right? You know, there's a, you remember in Isaiah 7, where you might not remember Isaiah 7, but do you remember where it talks about, and we always we use it to refer to Satan all the time. Remember, it says, you know, all morning how you shined and, and uh, you know, how you've been cast down. And, you know, we always talk about Satan, right? You know, uh, that matter of fact, that's where we, the only place in the Bible we get the word Lucifer is in Isaiah 7, right? Uh, dawn, son of the morning or son of the dawn, um, Lucifer. And, and that might be dualistic. I'm not trying to argue that that's not Satan or is Satan or any of that stuff. I think that's a discussion for a different day. That might be a dualistic prophecy. But that prophecy is really talking about the fall of the king of Babylon. It's not talking about necessarily about Satan there. That's it's not what that prophecy is about. Now, I'm not saying it's not dualistic. And I really don't want to get into that huge discussion this morning. But, but and it, maybe it is dualistic, okay? 
But I'm just saying that that prophecy particularly was about the fall of, of the Babylonian king. That's really what that was about in Isaiah 7. So those terminologies, we talk about things falling. If you remember Jesus said, Behold, I see Satan falling as lightning from heaven. Do you remember when Jesus says that? What does that mean? Does he literally, do we really see Satan falling like lightning? But in, in, in the Bible, in apocalyptic terminology, Jesus is saying there, he says, I'm seeing Satan's kingdom fall to the ground. See, I'm seeing Satan be defeated. I'm seeing see, Satan, I'm seeing Satan fall. So sometimes we, we, let's look at something else. Let's says the Lord God. Now I will spread my net over you with a company of many peoples, and they shall lift you up in my net. I will leave you on the land, I will cast you on the open field, and I will cause all the birds of the heavens to dwell on you, and I will satisfy the beasts of the whole earth with you. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your refuse. I will also make the land drink the discharge of your blood as far as the mountains and the ravines will be full of you. And when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you, and will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord. That's in Ezekiel chapter 32. An oracle concerning, and this is concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is, and that was about Egypt. And this is about Egypt. An oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud, and it's about to come to Egypt. And the idols of Egypt will tremble at the presence, presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. That's exactly what he said. He says, I'm coming on a swift cloud. That's exactly what he just said in Matthew. What does that mean? It means I'm coming, this is going to happen pretty quick, and I, and you will, and, and, and it's certain that I'm going to be there. I'm coming, right? I'm coming on a cloud. And that, and there's other connotations that I don't want to get into, but, but the truth is, is that you, what I'm trying to make the point here is, is that when you read that there and you think, oh, that's got to be the end, that's got to be the end. These exact words were spoken before and it was not the end. All right. It was the end of an age. It was the end of a people. It was the end of a nation. It was God's judgment, but it wasn't the end. So you can't go to Matthew and say, oh, this means this. No, you can't do that because it doesn't. Okay? Do, do we understand everything that means? I don't. I'll be honest, I don't. But I know from where it is and the context and the parallels in the Bible that it doesn't mean that he's talking about the end of the world here. And we're going to make that point more clear, but not today because we're running out of time. But next Sunday morning, we're going to make this point more clear because we get into the bottom of Matthew, we're going to see the transition where Jesus does start talking about the end of time. Because he's going to make that transition. If you want to read ahead, he's going to make that transition. Matthew, when he puts the big word in there, but of that day and hour, no man knows. The transition's coming in Matthew. We're still talking about the destruction of Jerusalem right here. We're not to the next question, the end of the age. We haven't got to that yet. So thanks for your time this morning. I'm out of time. <laughs>